So Corey, thanks for joining us. Uh, you recently published on behalf of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, what some people would say is a radical plan for a blanket music license for the internet. Um, first of all, before you sort of explain how it works, why is this needed now? Well, look, we've, we've spent a lot of time oh, since the Napster era trying to figure out how to boost artists' incomes online. And I think if there's one thing that EFF and artist groups completely agree on, is that artist incomes have not been improved in the round by the online distribution plans, right? By, by all of these different things. Filters didn't do it, and takedown notices didn't do it, and, and uh, you know, the broadcasting treaty didn't do it, all of these different things that we, that we created, DRM and, and so on. Um, but there are some things that have, have really increased artist incomes, and, and we see that wherever we see empirical research which is that if you give people who want to listen to music a chance to buy it at a fair price on fair terms, they do so, right? That the, the biggest structural impediment to getting people to pay for music is that it was just hard to pay for music. iTunes made it a lot easier. Um, Spotify made it a lot easier and so on. Now there are structural problems, right? Well, one of those big structural problems has been um, that although the music industry generated more income as a consequence of this, it didn't necessarily reach artists. And there is a parallel thing that happened while all of this was going on in tech, in media, and in most other industries, which is concentration. There were lots of labels when the first round of the Napster Wars kicked off. Now there's three major labels. Uh, there were lots of internet distribution systems when the Napster Wars kicked off. Now there's a small handful. And, and you know, it doesn't take an economics genius to understand that when sellers are selling into a market with just a few buyers, right, when there are just a few intermediaries that, that control it, that what those, uh, what those intermediaries do is they increase the share of the income that they retain in the industry. And as if that wasn't bad enough, as if it wasn't bad enough that we, we've spent two decades with internet advocates and artist advocates choosing a champion as between big tech and big content, and hoping that when they finished wrestling, one of them would toss us some crumbs, that uh, at the same time, the fallout of all of this has been uh, a regime in which it's far easier to censor speech than it ever has been, regardless of whether there's copyright infringement, you just ready fire aim, say that's a copyright infringement and it's guilty until proven innocent, and in which it's become much harder to create new platforms that are more artist friendly. And so something has to give. And what we did was we looked back at how other media had coped with it. What we did when the first phonograms came along, what we did when the first broadcasts came along, what we did when it was possible to play music in a commercial establishment. Uh, and, and what you find is that to varying degrees, we dispense with the negotiations, right, where the DJ in the club calls up the artist before they drop the needle and asks whether it's gonna be 50p or two pounds to play this track. And we also dispense with the right to, to exclude or prohibit, right? We don't say to Paul Anka, we understand that you don't like Sid Vicious singing my way, so you're not, you will stop him from doing so. And instead we just say, you have the right to get paid. You have the right to get paid, we'll create some kind of institution to pay you, but we're gonna take the transaction cost of deciding who can perform out of it. We said, well, like there are systems like that for the internet, they're weak costs, they were diluted, they were never well implemented. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't do it. I mean, that's how we got radio stations and hairdressers and nightclubs and all of the other places where people pay for and listen to music without those negotiations. We said, well, why not something like that for the internet as well? Well, why hasn't that happened before for the internet? And how would it be fundamentally different structurally? Music companies, uh, at whatever level they existed, sheet music publishers, recording uh, studios uh, and labels, um, broadcasters and so on, each layer of the value chain has liked the fact that they could procure raw material on a blanket license basis, but didn't like the fact that their transformed version of it was also available on that blanket license business. They wanted to, to get stuff in a sure and reliable way, but they wanted to sell it at auction because they understood that they could get a high bidder who might in the short term pay them more. There's a problem with auctions though, which is that um, eventually all the low bidders are forced out of business. 
And then the high bidders don't have to bid against each other quite so hard. And so in some ways, you know, they got enough rope to hang themselves. They, 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 they were, the labels were given the right to hold auctions, to, to you know, predicate access to catalog on the ability of a business development person to ink a contract with their catalog management people instead of having these these big structures, these big impersonal structures that treat all songs the same, right? They, you know, you can understand why Paul Anka might want to charge Sid Vicious more to record My Way than he would to record one of his B-sides, right? And so having gotten enough rope to hang themselves, having, having created a market, a winner-take-all market, they're now in a winner-take-all market facing those winners. Um, I think the other thing that's important to note, though, is that the tech industry really grew up with the uh, dismantling of anti-monopoly protection. That prior to Thatcher and Reagan and Mulroney in Canada and, and, and um, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Cole in Germany, that we had this idea that companies shouldn't be allowed to grow through mergers or through catching and killing the nascent competitors, right? You buy your nascent competitors and destroy them. Um, that they shouldn't be allowed to create vertical monopolies, right? You, you, could, you could be a label or a distributor or own a bunch of clubs, but you couldn't be a label or a distributor who owned a bunch of clubs. You couldn't be a search engine and an ad network, and a, and a, and a. And, and all of this starts to be dismantled around the time tech starts. You know, the Apple II Plus came out the year Ronald Reagan hit the, command, the campaign trail. And by the Napster era, we were really into the full swing of it. And we'd seen a lot of consolidation even then. And one of the things about consolidation is that it makes industries better at lobbying for an agreed upon set of goals. Because when there's 50 companies, you can't even agree on how to cater the meeting. But when there's five, you know, you can all sit around a table and decide on what's good for, for you, right? We, we look at that picture of Donald Trump and the tech leaders in Trump Tower in, in early 2017. And we go, how could all of those people sit around that boardroom table with Donald Trump and, and, and kiss his ours? But you know, I think that even before we ask that, we should ask, how is it that everyone who controls the tech industry sits around one modest-sized boardroom table in Trump Tower? And so what you had by the time that blanket licenses were being discussed and weakened for the internet was enough concentration that you didn't get major defectors. You didn't get Edgar Bronfman saying, okay, all of you go your way, but Universal is going our way, right? And we're gonna, we, will, we will do the blanket licenses. They were all in the same uh, uh, bus, going in the same direction, and that's a very difficult thing to divert. And difficult uh, to compress all that into a, a sort of soundbite. But how would a blanket license work? Because you've you've described it as something that you talked about monopolies. There, you said it's something that promotes competition, which is good for, from a business perspective, and from an artist perspective, it's almost you said a license to print money. Um, that sounds really good. So how would that work? And, sure. and the bigger question is, what needs to happen to make that a reality? Great. Well, uh, you know, it is easy to put into a soundbite if you elide a lot of details. So let me start by eliding a bunch of details, and then maybe we can drill into some of the details. Here's the way it works. Um, if you want to start an online service that does what the services that currently license music do, whether that's Spotify, YouTube, TikTok, or what have you, you go to a collecting society and you pay them a license fee based on the number of users you have. Uh, and that goes up and down as your users come and go. And the collecting society uses statistical sampling to figure out how music is being used on your platform. And they take the money that you have paid on behalf of your users and they give it to the artist. And half of the money goes directly to the artist, irrespective of their contractual arrangements with their labels. So even if the label says 100% of this collecting society money goes to Universal, Universal can't touch half of the money. Half of the money goes straight into the artist's pocket. That's the top level version, right? Every time someone wants to do something cool with music, they pay, they get to use the music, their users get to use the music, the artists get paid, and they get paid even if they've been corralled into a terrible contract that says that they have to recoup or some other thing has to happen before they start seeing a, uh, a dime. Now we can get into any details you'd like, because I understand that that's, that's a very high level version of the proposal. Why would, uh, apart from artists who I think would enjoy that, why would anyone else agree to do that? Why, you mean why would the labels agree to do it or yeah. why would anyone else agree to do it? Oh, yeah, sorry. So, mean, yes. so why, why yeah. would labels agree to do that? 
I mean, users would like to do it for sure, uh, as would as would people who want to start services. Um, why would why would the labels agree to do it? I don't think they would, uh, or, or at least I don't think they will willingly. I think that they're probably going to have to be drag kicking and screaming to it. But if you look at the proposals that have passed, that have done so little to improve the fortunes of artists, like the copyright directive in Europe, um, or or the previous copyright directive in 2001, uh, the EUCD that, that created the stricture on removing DRM and so on. In some cases, those rules have succeeded in transferring a few points from the balance sheet of a concentrated big tech industry to the balance sheet of a concentrated entertainment industry. But very few crumbs have landed on the tables of artists or, or of audiences, right? There, there weren't many dividends for anyone except for a group of giant companies and their investors, a small group of giant companies and their investors. And that was the, that was the, the benefit of these earlier policies. It was a benefit to the industrial players, but not to the artists, not to the labor pool. But these rules were only passed because the labor pool briefed for them, right? No one, no one went, Will someone please think of the record labels? We need to pass the copyright directive. The whole basis for passing the copyright directive was that if we did something to the record labels to make them happy, that they might share their joy with artists. And the reason that that was a credible proposition, because it's on, on its face, it's not a very credible proposition. Anyone who's ever watched how contracts unfold knows that that's not a very uh, credible proposition. And the reason that it was credible is that artists endorsed it. Artist groups, by and large, came forward for it. Right? So you have the artist groups who wrongly believed that if they made the investors in their work richer, that the investors would share with them. And I think that if you offer artists a more direct way to get paid, right? If you if you just jump clear of this ridiculous notion that the only way we can hope to help artists is to help the firms that have historically exploited artists. And hope they have a, a you know, a, a Christmas morning miracle where they change their minds and decide that rather than putting those extra monies into executive compensation and uh, and and shareholder dividends, that they'll just up their royalty rates. That will move artists onto the side where artists belong, which is on the side of our audiences and on the side of free expression. Do you think that what you need, what what is needed, is for a big name artist like Jay Z? to support something like this, to convince labels I, I, and fans? Sure, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that historically we've seen artists come forward for, you know, a, a more fan-centric version of this and a fairer version of it. I mean, you know, they, they, they not necessarily this exact proposal, but everyone from, you know, Public Enemy, who were in the crosshairs of uh, sampling copyright wars, to uh, the Beastie Boys, to you know, Taylor Swift when she was negotiating with Universal and negotiated for uh, a higher, uh, uh, negotiated for the dividend from the sale of a of a uh, streaming service that Universal had been involved with to be uh, not uh, checked against the uh, recoupment accounts of the other artists, but rather distributed to all other artists irrespective of their recoupment. Uh, position whether they still owed their money uh, owed money to the labels that they would just get that as cash on top of it so you know there are lots of artists who who have understood this um, and some of whom are, are very big and a lot of independent artists have also understood this uh, and I think that you know by and large um, most artists want to get on with making art right I mean this is this has always been one of the crises of, of art is not that artists are incapable of understanding business or anything. I don't buy that, you know, left brain, right brain thing. But, but rather that it is hard to be an artist. You probably got a day job and you, you're trying to make art and making art is hard in and of itself. And then trying to figure out how to run the business side of it is difficult. And so you get people who end up with unscrupulous managers or unscrupulous labels who take advantage of the fact that artists are too busy to be on top of the business side of things. And artists generally, on, when they're looking to understand which position works best for them, they don't have the time to dig into all of the proposals, so they take their cues from their institutions, from their organizations. And sometimes those organizations have been really good. Uh, I worked with the International Music Man Managers Fund, no, International Music Managers Federation at the United Nations on the Broadcasting Treaty. That would have been really bad, bad news for a bunch of recording artists. Uh, and so sometimes those organizations are really good and sometimes they're not. 
but I think that if we can win the organizations over, a lot of artists who are quite rightly not focused on the minutiae of statistical sampling methods and licensing, but instead are trying to figure out how to make a great song and perform it and connect with their audiences, will go, okay, well, if they trust it, uh, then I, I, I will provisionally trust it until I hear otherwise. And, and, I, and I think that's probably the best strategy to do. Yeah. I mean, we're living in a, a very confusing and uncertain world at the moment. Um, one of the things we've, in the UK at the moment, similarly to other campaigns in North America, there's a campaign running called Broken Record, which is campaigning for dramatically increased revenues from streaming to go to musicians. Um, and of course, what we're seeing uh, on Tuesday this week uh, around the world is the music industry going silent for the day or publicly silent with the intention of reflecting initiating change um, w w within the industry and in the world. Now, those two things don't seem so connected, but w when you look at it in a different way, controlling licensing, is about power and control, it's about money. And would changing licensing and the contracts that are part of that be a meaningful progressive step, not only in um, helping artists, but helping other inequalities and problems that we're seeing in the world? Copyright systems around the world are mindful of the fact that artists are often in a, a buyer's market for their work, work and they're selling into it. So, you know, we have, in many copyright systems, the idea of reversion. So regardless of the contract that you have to sign because there's only four labels and only one of them has made you an offer or there's only five publishers or what have you, after 35 years, you can take your copyrights back in the US. There's a similar initiative in Canada. There are various versions of it in Europe and so on. Lots of artists have taken advantage of this. George Clinton just reverted huge wax of his catalog. And then they just go straight to the platform and they offer the, the music to the platform. And instead of doing a split with their labels, they just get all the money. Right. So we've, we've always had the acknowledgement that artists are in an uneven bargaining position with their labels for most of their careers, if not all of their careers. And we've always had some escape valve that takes recognition of that. At the same time, we also see that as the tech industry itself becomes concentrated, you have a, another version of this relationship where you know you have uh, um, companies like YouTube or Spotify or Amazon who if they say to an entertainment company either you take our terms or we don't carry your work that that's that's a, a, a crippling blow to the to the company you know and so uh, if we are going to create diversity in the relationship between uh, music companies and distributors tech distributors then we need more tech distributors. And the way to get them is to lower the cost of being a tech distributor. I mean, the thing, you know, the Napster Wars teach us a lot of lessons, but one of the lessons it should teach us is that a couple of college kids can invent a music distribution system that is beloved by hundreds of millions of people for nothing, right? The only thing they, could, they didn't have was an army of glad-handing suits to ink contracts. And if they'd had that, then they would have had a sustainable business, right? So you have um, so many potential firms, and not just firms, but artist cooperatives, uh, uh, you know, micro labels, um, uh, fan co-ops that serve specific niches. You know, I, I'm, I'm on the board of a charitable nonprofit called MetaBrains. We do Music Brains, which is the, the music metadata thing. And you know, when you looked at how artists organize the music they love, there are such narrow genres and such intense feeling about those narrow genres, you could imagine that those fans would happily pay to belong to a service with a half dozen of their friends or 50 of their friends or a thousand of their friends where they got to really geek out about this music without worrying about takedown notices. And if the licenses are priced at, say, you know, right now Facebook pays a per user license for music. Um, so what we would do is you know, Facebook has 2.5 billion users. We divide that by 2.5 billion, and that would be the per user price. If it were priced that way, if running a five user service was five, two and a half billionths of what running Facebook cost and licensing fees, and the only difference is that you weren't enriching a bunch of lawyers and business development people, then the artists would get paid, the fans would be happy, the relationship between the labels and tech would change because you'd have lots of different places where music was enjoyed by people who wanted to ensure that artists were getting paid. And artists would no longer be 
prisoners to the uneven negotiating positions that they find themselves in when they negotiate with labels. Um, we've gone through the whole conversation without even mentioning the blockchain, which is an achievement in itself. Um, uh, but the technology exists. The, the will is there from many sides of the industry to change this. But will change happen? And how, how will that change happen in, in, sort of a, in, in terms of progress? Right, so as a science fiction writer, I am keenly aware that predicting the future is a thing that charlatans do in tents at traveling fairs and that serious people do, should not try to do. So instead of talking about what, what will or should happen, I can talk about some next steps. So this plan has a lot of uh, big empty spaces in it, right? Uh, empty spaces that have never been satisfactorily filled. Like what does a collecting society look like if it's fully transparent, how should it operate? You mentioned blockchain, 90% of all conversations involving blockchain are non-consensual. Um, but what does a collecting society look like if, it, if, if you know how they're sampling, you know what the data that they get when they sample is, what does, uh, what does a fair apportionment as between composers and the various performers on a track, as well as anyone whose material they've sampled look like, right? What is that formula? Um, how do you identify rights holders for work that are orphans or whose, uh, whose rights are in contention? What does a rigorous statistical sampling method look like? Statistics are an incredible tool for extrapolating from known data to the unknown worlds that you weren't able to sample. But it's so easy to do wrong. It's so easy to do statistics wrong. and There's so many pitfalls. All of those questions are hard questions to answer. And it's the kind of thing that you can imagine scholars studying. It's the kind of thing you can imagine having panels on at industry conventions once those start again. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you could imagine going through the existing literature. So, you know, for example, sampling in music is something that's not, not sampling songs, but doing statistical sampling for, for royalty payments is a well understood phenomenon. And then we need a, a legislative uh, angle. And I think that that's inevitable because the copyright directive in the EU was a catastrophe uh, and will be a catastrophe. People who claim that it didn't require filters were lying or wrong or deluded. Now that we know it requires filters, we also should understand that those filters will not work, um, that they will both allow infringement through and fail to catch infringement. And that, you know, when that all happens, we will have a choice. We can be the old lady who swallow the fly. We can swallow a spider to catch the fly, right? Try and make the, try and double down on the copyright directive, do more of what wasn't working and see if it works if we do it harder, or we can change our approach. So I think there will be a moment in our not too distant future where the catastrophic foolishness of the copyright directive is thrown into stark relief and everybody wants to do something about it. And that will be a moment, I think, for legislation. Mm. Fascinating. So Cora Dottero, thank you ever so much for joining us.